fourth verse, could we bear from one another what he daily bears from us? Well, that's what the Lord calls us to do. So we need to pray for the strength to do that. We can't do it as well as him, of course, but we do need to do it. Well, let's uh, take a look at our text this evening. We're going to look at the next section in John chapter 15, verses 12 through 17. Again, Jesus speaking to his disciples, giving them the um, last as it were, comforts and instructions uh, before he would go to the cross, um, die for their sins, be raised. They would receive some instruction later because he was with them over a period of I think it was 40 days, uh, teaching them regarding the things of the kingdom of heaven. But uh, those things, if they were written down or included in the epistles, these are the things that have been written down. We have everything the Lord intends for us to have, and it is enough. It's what we need. Well, let's read what he has for us this evening. Uh, Jesus says, This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. This I command you, that you love one another. May the Lord bless again his word to our understanding uh, this evening. <clears throat> now this morning Jesus was showing us how we might be filled with his joy. And when he said what he said this morning, he wasn't focusing so much on that subjective kind of joy that we can have when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, the kind, I think, that comes simply by his being present in our souls. There's a certain kind of joy that comes from that, something we can experience, something that, that sort of bears us up even when we're going through the most difficult times. But the kind of joy that Jesus was referring to this morning was that kind that comes from fulfilling our heart's desire. When you and I can please the one that we love most of all, it fills our hearts with joy. Uh, the joy that Jesus had came from obeying his Father. It was the delight of his soul to please him through his service because he loved him so much. Well, Jesus said our joy is going to come in the same way when we can please the one whom we love most of all, and that is Jesus. Now, remember, Jesus said in order to do this, we have to abide in Him. We have to be connected to Him by faith. We must have the Holy Spirit working in our souls through that connection. Jesus says, if we are connected to Him, and we do have the Spirit of God. We can bear fruit, we can bear much fruit, and we will have the joy and the satisfaction that that actually brings. Now this evening we see another way that we can be filled with joy which really isn't another way because it's one of those fruits that we are to bear. It's one of the ways in which we express our obedience to the Lord, one of the ways in which we show Jesus that we love Him, and that is by loving each other as Jesus has loved us. Uh, Jesus earlier commanded His disciples this very thing. He says in John 13, verse 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. I think you understand that to love our neighbor is not really a new command because this is something that the Lord has required from the beginning. To love our neighbor is what, is what God actually put uh, or you might say wrote upon Adam's heart in the same way that he'd 
writes upon our hearts his commandments in the new covenant, I do believe Adam had that law written upon his heart by the Holy Spirit. He knew what God wanted him to do. He knew that God wanted him to love his neighbor. There weren't too many around in those days. There was Eve. But um, as, you know, as the population grew, that was what he was supposed to be doing. We know that when the Lord brought his people out of Egypt, that this was something he required of them. As a matter of fact, when he gave the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, he was simply repeating, again, that law that was written upon the heart of Adam. But the Lord said to Moses in order to instruct the people in Leviticus 19, verse 18. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now, I only say that to say that loving your neighbor as yourself is not a new commandment, okay? But what Jesus is saying here is a new commandment because no one has ever loved his neighbor like Jesus loved his disciples. So instead of loving one another now as we love ourselves, we are to love each other as Jesus loves us. And that's a much higher calling, I believe, than the former. Jesus tells us in verse 12 of our text, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Now, when we think about loving our neighbor, we generally go to that standard we know the Lord has given us as to how we are to love our neighbor, and that is the Ten Commandments. We know particularly the last six commandments are targeting that specifically. Paul tells us as much in Romans 13, verses 8 through 10. He says, "'Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another.'" For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Now, when we think about loving our neighbor, this is where we go because God tells us here how we are to love him. Love fulfills the law towards our neighbor when we love according to the law. Now, also, I'll just mention in passing, the first four commandments teach us how to love God. Jesus says they can be summarized as follows in Mark 12, verse 30. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. But I want us to see here that Jesus doesn't point to the law to tell us how we should love one another. Rather, he points to himself. Now, the reason why he does this is because, for one thing, he happens to be the embodiment of the law. Remember that this is the standard that Jesus lived by in order to save us. It was the rule that he had to keep to fulfill all righteousness for us. He had to love the Father perfectly. He had to love his neighbor as himself. But I think we need to recognize here that he appears to have gone even further in his love for his disciples. Now, again, I think there is a distinction between how we are to love our neighbor that is outside of Christ and how we are to love those within the body of Christ. And we understand that Jesus has a different kind of love for those outside the church or outside of faith in him and those who are his children, those who are his brothers, those who are his friends who actually are trusting in him. And we see that, of course, in the way that he loved his own, how he loved his disciples. So Jesus says he is the example, and certainly a living example is better than a written one or a written standard. Now that Jesus is giving us, has, well, has given us a living example, he calls us to follow it. Now, the reason why he wants to follow it, of course, is because it's the best possible example that we, could poss you know, that we could have, the example that Jesus gave us because he did it perfectly. He wants us to follow his example because he did it right. 
Essentially, this is what God originally intended. This is the way that man should have originally lived. And he actually, when he came into the world, had the power to live this way because he had the Spirit of God, he had the law of God written in his heart. But Jesus also wants us to follow his example because, as we've seen before, it is the witness that he wants to give to the world of what God intended them to be, of what God wanted them to be, and how this standard of love is actually possible through the power of the Holy Spirit which is given through the gospel. The gospel is able to transform lives. Remember what Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. So Jesus says this again in verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. And again, remembering what we saw in former weeks, Jesus also tells us in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So this is my commandment, that you love one another as I've loved you. If you love me, this is what you're going to do. So our love for one another, the standard is Jesus, but we will do it because we love Jesus. I mentioned earlier, we need to love him most of all. And our love for our neighbor, our enemy, our brethren needs to flow through our love for him. So if we love him, we will keep his commandment. His commandment is that we love each other the way that he has loved us. Now, how far are we to go in our love for each other? Well, we're to go as far as Jesus went. Now, Jesus isn't speaking here. We do need to understand in, in the context, Jesus is not speaking about how we should love mankind in general. He's speaking specifically, more specifically, about the love that we should have for one another as members of his body. We are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves, but we are to love one another as Jesus loves us. So what's the difference? Well, um, we can't really spell out all the differences this evening, so we'll just take the one that Jesus gives us. How far are we to go? How does this kind of love go beyond perhaps the love that we are to have for our neighbor? Jesus says in verse 13, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. This love is a love that lays, is willing even to die for those who are our brothers and our sisters as Jesus did. Now look at what Jesus did out of love for us. Jesus, if we had time to survey everything, we'll just do this briefly. Jesus gave up the riches of heaven. Uh, he existed eternally with the Father, but he was willing to, as, as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, he was willing to uh, give up those riches and to become poor for our sake. He was willing to become a man, to take our nature and, and to take, you know, not a perfect nature, but, well, there was no sin in him, of course, but the likeness of sinful flesh. He didn't come in, you know, this picture of perfection, but he looked like the rest of us. And in that situation, he was willing to love his father, and he was willing to love his neighbor perfectly, and he was willing to obey the commandments and to go to the cross and to take our sins upon himself and to take the curse of those sins upon himself and to lay down his life for us. That is the way that Jesus loves his own. And I think you understand that is something Jesus does only for his own. For those who either trust, have trusted him or trust in him now or will trust him in the future. Jesus is kind to all. We know that. He says it in his word. Uh, he causes his sun to shine on the just and the unjust, the rain to fall on both. He offers his gospel to everyone, but he has a particular love for those who belong to him, for those who are his friends. Now again, who are his friends? Well, as we saw this morning, they are those who trust Him because they love Him and those who show that they love Him 
by their obedience. Jesus said to his disciples in verse 14, You are my friends if you do what I command you. Now, again, we have to be careful that we don't read this as Jesus telling us, you're not my friends unless you obey me. If you obey me, then you'll be my friends. That's not what he's really saying. Jesus actually laid down his life ultimately so that he might make his disciples his friends. Paul reminds us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, when he says, you are my friends if you do what I command you, what he's saying is that is the evidence that you are my friends, that you really do love me because you obey me. But that power to obey comes from trusting Jesus, which comes from loving him, which comes from the Holy Spirit because of the mercy and grace of God, which was given because Jesus was willing to lay down his life. Now, if we love Jesus, if we are trusting him, if we are obeying him, then we also are his friends, which means that Jesus laid down his life for us. But if that's true of us, that we are his friends, then Jesus calls us to lay down our lives for each other and to love one another as he loved us. And again, the extent of which is we are to lay down our lives for one another. Now we might ask, what does that kind of love look like? Because obviously it's going to be expressed in a different way than the way that Jesus expressed it to us, at least with regard to laying down our lives. We are not called by Jesus to die for each other's sins as Jesus died for ours. We don't need to do that because Jesus laid down his life once and for all. But there are other ways that we can lay down our lives. We can do it literally to save one another from death if the situation requires it and the Lord actually gives us the opportunity to do that. I mean, we see even unbelievers laying down their lives for people they care about. Jesus laid down his life for us and he says, I want you to love one another as I have loved you, which means that we may lay down our lives for one another, that perhaps under certain circumstances we must. Now that's not going to happen every day, obviously, we can only do that once, so there's other ways that we can also lay down our lives for one another. We can protect one another as Jesus protected his disciples and as he protects us. But we can also do this by setting perhaps a portion of our lives aside, laying down our lives in other ways, such as uh, setting aside our own wants, our own desires, perhaps our own leisure and our own comfort, perhaps setting aside a portion of what the Lord has given to us, sometimes even setting aside things that are our responsibilities that need to be done, but because the need that is presented before us is greater than the responsibility that we have to do, we set even those things aside in order to help a brother or a sister in the Lord Jesus Christ with their needs. Whatever their needs may be, physical needs, material needs, spiritual needs, we take the time to help them. Didn't Jesus do that? Didn't he take time whenever he was presented him. He spent virtually the majority of his life serving others, serving the Old Testament church, his people. He came to his own, but his own didn't receive him. They were his own. He ministered to them, but particularly those who trusted him, who believed in him in his inner circle. Jesus says he wants us to do the same thing. John writes in 1 John 3, verses 18 through 20, little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. We shall know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him in whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Again, Jesus did exactly that. And now he tells us, again, verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another 
just as I have loved you. Now, another thing Jesus did was to make the disciples his intimate friends by taking them into his confidence. Now, notice verse 15. Jesus says to his disciples, No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Now, Jesus, he says, no longer do I call you slaves. Now, I want you to notice that (laughs) Jesus had called them slaves. And he calls us slaves, okay? Because that's what they were. That's what we are. Uh, He said to them in Matthew chapter 10, verses 24 through 25, and he was referring to them, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple to become like his teacher and the slave like his master. Now, Jesus, when he says, no longer do I call you slaves, neither did he mean they wouldn't be slaves or that he wouldn't call them slaves again because we're going to see in John 15, verse 20, which is only three verses away, he's going to say the same thing again in John 15, 20. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master? If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. The Apostle Paul called himself or referred to himself as a bondservant or slave of Christ, something he actually gloried in, that he was a a servant of Christ. He writes in Romans 1.1, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. And just so you understand, when Jesus said, no longer do I call you slaves, every example we have just seen of the word slave, the same Greek word is behind it. Even where Paul calls himself a bondservant, it's still the word translated in our text, slave. So, no longer do I call you slaves, but you will still be slaves, okay? Yes, we are slaves, in a certain sense. Now, the same thing is true of us, okay, that we are slaves or bondservants of Christ. So, what is Jesus talking about here when he says, I'm not going to call you slaves anymore, but I'm going to call you friends? What is the difference that he's making? Well, that has to do, of course, first of all, with love. We understand that Jesus has not enslaved us against our wills. He's not some kind of a tyrannical master who is commanding us to do things that he just wants for his own, you know, his own glory and so forth, but rather he is commanding us to do things that are good, and he is commanding us not against our wills, but according to our wills or according to our hearts. The difference is that we love him, And we are obeying him voluntarily. We are not enslaved, as it were, externally, but we are slaves of the heart. Remember, again, what Jesus said in John 14, verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So this is a slave relationship. Yes, he is the master still. We are the slave, but it's different. We obey him because we love him. But there's more. We are still more than slaves. Jesus calls us friends, slave friends. Just as Jesus told his disciples that they were more than slaves because he had taken them into his confidence, this is something that masters do not do with their slaves. Masters tell their slaves to do things and they do it. In this case, Jesus brings these, his servants, into his confidence, and he reveals to them what his plans are, what's on his heart, what he's thinking about, what's going to happen in the future. I mean, think about all that Jesus has uh, divulged to his disciples regarding the plan of salvation and what was about to happen, what he was about to do. He was going to lay down his life to save them from their sins. He was going to, um, after he died, he was going to be in the tomb for three days, but then he was going to rise again. 
he had uh, revealed to them what his plan was for them and for his church, that they would be sent out to make disciples of all the nations. He would be with them, and they knew what they could expect from him, uh, that he would give them success as they were going, but also what would happen when they had completed their particular task, which was to evangelize the Roman Empire, that he would come again in judgment against Israel. He told them so that they would know, so that they would be prepared because it was something they were actually going to go through. He told them what was going to happen in the near future, that after that time frame, the gospel was going to go out to all the nations. And then he told them what was going to happen in the distant future, that he was going to come again to raise the dead. He was going to gather together everybody who was still living to the final judgment. And then he was going to bring them and all of his children into the new heavens and the new earth. His disciples were more than slaves. They were his friends. Jesus had taken them into his confidence. And the same thing is true of us. We are more than just simply slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are slaves. We are bond servants. But remember, oftentimes the idea there is what we see in the Old Testament about the man who has been set free but who doesn't want to go free, who wants to attach himself to his master's house because he loves him. Well, it's the same thing with us. We don't want to be free from the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to serve him. We want to be attached to his house. We want to be his bondservants. And so we are. But we are more than that. We are also his friends because Jesus has taken us into his confidence as well. Everything that Jesus revealed to his disciples, we've already seen, Jesus granted them his Holy Spirit so that they could write down that we might also have these things, that we might also know these things. Jesus has taken us into his confidence by giving to us his word. We have his plan. We have his blueprint of what he is doing and what he will do in the future. He has given us of His Holy Spirit so that we uh, can understand what He says in His Word and receive it and believe it. So basically, we are the friends of our Lord Jesus Christ. But I, I do believe that there is also an application here in the way that we are to love one another. Because remember, we are to love one another as Jesus loved us. Well, Jesus... We took those who were his servants into his confidence, and he called them friends. Now, we don't have any servants. We don't have any slaves that are serving us today. But certainly, we, um, there is an application. If Jesus, who is so far above us, was willing to condescend to our level to call us friends, to take us into that kind of relationship, how much more should we be friends to each other? take each other into our confidence that we might love one another more intimately and work together to do what the Lord has called us to do. Uh, we are to serve one another, true, but we are to be true friends to one another as well. We are to love one another as Christ has loved us. Now finally, Jesus willingly chose to enter into this relationship with his disciples. He says in verse 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. Jesus chose them. He chose them to be his apostles. I think that's what he has particularly in mind right here, but we do need to understand what's going on behind this. He received them as the ones that he would choose because he knew the Father had chosen them in eternity to give them to him for that purpose. But Jesus chose them for this work. He chose to use them to do his work. He chose them to bear fruit to do something that we all hope that He will use us to do as well, to do something that He would establish, something that He would render permanent, something that He would use forever. In their case, He did. He used them to lay the foundation of the church, and that, of course, not only through their labors, but through the Word, uh, 
that they gave to us that, that the Lord actually wrote through them by way of inspiration. He chose them also, uh, chose to give them, I should say, the promise of answered prayer. Here again we see the promise of answered prayer. He gave them this promise because he had called them, he chose them to do this work, that this work would be established, they were going to need help. So he says, I'm, I've chosen to give you this privilege that you may ask the Father for whatever you want and he will give it to you. Now, everything that's true of the disciples there is really true of us as well, except, of course, for the particular office that they happen to have. We didn't choose to be Christians. The Lord chose us. John writes in 1 John 4, 19, just one of many passages where we understand this is the case. We love because he first loved us. Now, we did believe when we heard the gospel, there is a certain sense, of course, in which we chose him, but we only chose him because the Father first chose us and determined to give us his son, or to give us to his son, as the reward for his work. He chose to give us his Holy Spirit so that we would be able to choose the Lord Jesus Christ, so we love because he first loved us. He also chose the work that he has given us to do and whatever fruit that we've produced or ever will produce, we have done it because the Lord has chosen to give us that work and to allow us to do it. The Lord has also chose to establish whatever work we've done and as something that he has used, hopefully, by his grace or will use to advance his kingdom, and the Lord has also chosen to reward us for it, a reward that we'll be able to enjoy forever. And as we've also seen, he has also chosen to give to us the promise of answered prayer, because he has entrusted to us his work. And as we go out to do that work, Jesus is going to be there to help us, and he tells us that we can appeal to heaven at any time for anything we need, and the Lord will provide it. Now again, how do we apply this to how we can love one another in the way that Jesus has loved us? Well, it gets perhaps a little bit more difficult to apply it. But if the Lord has <clears throat> loved us in this way and has received us in this way, we also ought to love and receive one another. Now, the Father did not choose us, and Jesus did not choose us, nor did he choose his disciples because they were lovely or desirable. As a matter of fact, as you know, we, you, you've heard about the, the idea of election from another perspective, basically, that, that God looks down the quarters of time and he sees that we're going to choose him, and so he chooses us. Well, when God looks down the quarters of time, what does he see? apart from His grace in our lives. He sees enemies. He sees people hating Him and nobody choosing Him because we come into this world dead in trespass and sin, as we saw this morning. Jesus didn't choose us. The Father didn't choose us because we were lovely, because we were desirable, or even because we chose Him. He chose us while we were His enemies, he chose us purely because that is what He wanted to do. He loved us when we were unlovely, and it was His love that actually made us lovely in Christ by sending His Son to die for us, to do the work necessary to redeem us, by sending His Spirit so we would trust in Jesus, so that we would be in Jesus, so that in Jesus we would actually be something that is lovely. Now, that's what it was for God, and that's what it was for Jesus. But now, thankfully, we don't have the same problem. At least not in following this command with the command to love one another. Uh, we will have this problem as far as loving those who are unlovely and receiving them and so forth uh, with regard to our enemies because they are not like the Lord Jesus Christ. But when we understand that God's choice changes his people into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ and into his likeness, it's not so difficult to receive them 
You know, Jesus chose his disciples when they were unlovely, but he granted to them the grace to change them. We simply need to receive those who are already transformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ when Jesus says, I want you to love one another even as I have loved you. It's not so hard to do when we see Jesus in one another. You know, that's the, um, that's the common denominator, isn't it? I mean, there's all these different cultures on earth, all these different ethnicities with all their different ways of doing things and languages, and we've run into a number of them, even in this small congregation. But what is it that makes it so easy to love and receive them when they're so different than we are? It's because Jesus is being formed in them. And when we see that, it's easy to receive them. It's easy to love them. So we really don't have a choice to make as Jesus did. If he's chosen someone, we simply need to receive them and love them because he has received them because he loves them. So again, Jesus closes with this repetition, which is really the, the whole point behind this in verse 17. This I command you, that you love one another. And let's not forget, love one another, Jesus says, as I have loved you. Jesus is the standard. He is the example that we are to follow. It's a perfect example. It's a living example. It's much broader than just simply laying down his life, but perhaps that is a summary of everything he wants us to do. He wants us to love and receive one another even as he has loved and received us. So may the Lord again grant to us more of his spirit. Remember the spirit that comes through that connection to the vine. May he grant to us more of his spirit so that we might love each other more and that we might love all of his children wherever we may find them as our Lord Jesus has loved us. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us do that.